Good afternoon. I am calling to order our regularly scheduled meeting of the Intergovernmental Relations Committee. My name is Elizabeth Glidden. I'm the chair of this committee, and I'm joined today by Council Members Quincy Cano, Council President Johnson, and Council Member Andrew Johnson, and we are a quorum of the committee. We have six items uh, for consideration today. Um, and I will just note that um, on item number five, which was an amendment to an existing policy position on paid sick leave to uh, better align with um, some legislation that is currently being proposed, um, I also have a proposed uh, resolution for my colleagues and, uh, and I will pass that out right now just so that you have that and can take a look and then I will offer that when we are to that item. Our first item is a consent agenda item or re excuse me, receive and file item. This is a typical action that we take after we have done a conflict of interest check for our uh, lobbying services and this would be to receive and file the report of the ethics, excuse me, ethics officer regarding federal lobbying representation by the firm Franzen Law and Policy Group LLC. So I will move to receive and file that item. All in approval, please say aye. 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 And that is received and, and filed. Now we have several uh, discussion items. I think all of them are relatively short. The first, though, is a verbal report as we are into our uh, state uh, um, uh, legislation, legislative session of the current year. And uh, Mr. Ranieri, I think, will lead us through any updates on what is happening at sure. the Capitol. Madam Chair, is it okay if, uh, my name is Gene Ranieri, I'm the Director of Government Relations for the City of Minneapolis. Is it okay if I just have a quick federal update because there's one Absolutely. issue that's occurred? Madam Chair, as you were aware, several years ago, this City Council passed a resolution, a legislative program at the federal level to support uh, money remittances to nations like Somalia to make sure the money could get from here to Somalia. Uh, there has been a recent development where one of the banks now is dropping and doing that. And I have to report that Representative Ellison has started some activity in Washington and maybe uh, asking us for some support to try and get those remittances back on track with banks. And that was something that I know we had a large hearing here several years ago. I just wanted to keep, and legislation was passed, but many banks are pulling back because they're fearful of the penalties that if something occurs, there's some severe penalties. So he's trying to work that through. And I might just ask Mr. Ranieri, um for you and your staff to consider whether there is anything in addition to what we already have reflected in our current policies that we should be doing on this issue to further support uh, Congressman Ellison, knowing how important this issue is to a large segment of our community yeah. in Minneapolis Madam Chair, and in the state. Madam Chair, that's our next step. Uh, his staff is in Washington at a retreat. We will be talking to them probably early next week or next week, and we'll uh, come back with some ideas if, we, if he needs some recommendations from us. All right, thank you. At the state level, uh, all team members will be making a presentation on certain items. Uh, we'll start off with, uh, with Sasha talking about local government aid and property tax relief. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Sasha Bergman from the IGR department. I just wanted to provide a brief update on a couple of the tax items, starting with local government aid. Um, on January 27th, I believe, Governor Dayton released his proposed budget, which is just kind of a, a large collection of his proposed ideas, but there's no actual bill language at this point to go on. Um, there have been several committee hearings where the various commissioners have presented their ideas to the committees in the appropriate jurisdictions, and then um, there's been public testimony taken at some of these hearings as well. Uh, in the area of local government aid, the governor recommended sustained funding of local government aid for cities across the state, uh, which means there's no, uh, no cuts to the program under his proposed budget, but also no increases, which would mean for, you know, for the 2015 is 517 million for the state, um, approximately 77, or 77 million here in Minneapolis, and I think that might tick up just a tiny bit in 2016 and ongoing under current law. 
In the House, there have been a couple of bills, or three bills introduced actually, to modify local government aid uses, including um, two that would direct a portion of local government aid uh, for city, that are requiring that cities use a portion of local government aid on housing needs, and then one that would require dedication of a portion of the entire LGA pool to a loan program to renovate water treatment facilities. Um, none of these bills have been hearing, or scheduled for a hearing at this point to date. Um, also in the governor's budget, he proposed a railroad property tax change, which um, looks like it would be modifying the railroad property tax um, base to include rolling stock, which is not currently included in Minnesota, um, and then also to modernize the calculation of the tax itself and how that's calculated. Apparently, it's very outdated, and so that would be um, just kind of making technical changes, I think. And we'll be watching this. Depending on how it's drafted in bill form, it could have impacts on the city or even increased revenues. Uh, in the area of direct property tax relief in the House and the Senate, um, they've each heard various bills to modify uh, direct property tax relief programs for homeowners, in general, just to kind of expanding them or increasing them. And at this point, um, they were just laid over for possible inclusion in a later omnibus bill, and the governor did not make any changes in this area in his proposed budget, so that funding is sustained as well. Uh, earlier this week, the Senate heard two bills related to the This Old House, This Old Shop um, tool, I guess, for cities to use. This is something that is in the city's policy positions for 2015. It was a program that was in place from 1993 to 2003, and it would provide um, tools for a city to spur redevelopment or development and investment in older homes and uh, business structures through a property tax exclusion. Uh, both of these bills met su pretty significant opposition from the As Assessing Officers Association and um, were laid over for possible inclusion uh, in an omnibus bill later, and so we'll see if those also get a hearing in the House. Uh, regarding fiscal disparities, just wanted to make uh, council members aware that the property tax division in the House heard an informational overview on fiscal disparities earlier this week. Um, there were lots of questions and interest uh, generated among the, the committee members, and they, um, because many of them are new, and so we'll be continuing to watch this issue to see if any bills are introduced to change the legislation or to change the current law. Um, my understanding is that it's been changed uh, very infrequently since its inception in 19. 71, so it's probably unlikely, but we'll continue to watch that. And then finally, on the Upper Harbor Terminal, just wanted to update um, council members that we have been working on draft legislation and are talking to various members at the legislature about this, and we will continue to work on that and keep you apprised. And I'm happy to stand for any questions. Any questions for Ms. Bergman? Not thank you. Any right now, thank you. Turn it back to Mr. Ranieri. All right. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'll cover pensions and Data practices, if I can start with data practices first. Uh, the Senate uh, Civil Law Committee passed Senate File 86, which is the, low, the uh, place and plate reader bill, which would extend the, the time that it, the, the, the uh, documents or the information is held by a city, by a city to 90 days. Right now, under uh, uh, a temporary classification, we do have a 90 day, hold, 90 day limit. Uh, the bill has been sent from the committee, it was to the floor, then it was re-referred to rules because there was a concern by one member that maybe it should go to another policy committee. So uh, that's where the bill is in the Senate. In the House, it has not yet been heard. Uh, there is a large discussion about how long should this data be kept. Some legislators believe that if there's not a hit uh, on the reader by a squad car, uh, then uh, it should be not stored at all, should be eliminated, so it's another zero retention. The Senate, at least the committee, is at 90 days. Last year they did 90 days. I think in the House last year, I think it was zero. So uh, we will be seeing what happens as this, as this bill moves along. Another bill that uh, is interest to the city is the whole discussion, there is no legislation, there's one bill introduced and that's also in the Senate and, that, and in a companion in the House. The Senate author is Senator Latz, the House author is Senate Representative Cornish. That deals with body camps. And the body cam bill, I think it has the data to be private for up to a year, for a year. There will be a hearing on Tuesday in the House Civil Law Committee where there will be a discussion by police chiefs and police departments on explaining the technology to the committee. The House Committee is fairly new, fairly young, and the chair would like to have 
you know, LPR, what is it? And so there's going to be an explanation, maybe even maybe a demonstration by video, what an LPR is or what it does. And the same thing is going to be done for body cams. And I think officers from the city of Burnsville and from our MPD will also be talking about body cams. It's intended to have no discussion on any bills. There'll be no bills presented. It's more information on technology. In the area of pensions, the uh, Senate has appointed their... Uh, their folks to be on the pension commission, the House has not, so we'll be waiting for uh, that commission to finish, hopefully be appointed soon. Then the commission will start meeting. Uh, the bills to be discussed, or should there be, what some of the issues that be discussed, I think number one would be, what's gonna be the uh, estimated rate of return? What should be the, the uh, interest rate that the uh, investment should aim to be at? Right now, I think it's at 8%, there's discussion, should it be backed up to 8.5% or should it even go lower? Another issue is, what is the, should there be an increase by the employers and employees to PERA and the other funds? Uh, under current law, every two years, PERAs make a recommendation. They struggled in December because they looked at the numbers and felt they were in pretty good shape, but they need to make a recommendation. So they made a recommendation of, I think, 0.1% increase, but are going to recommend to the legislature that they be given some more discretion and flexibility in determining when to ask for, when to implement a uh, employer-employee increase. Because they're sure they, they, they said they just implemented it this year and are not sure if it's already needed. So there'll, there'll be some discussion as possibly that there may not be an employer-employee increase this year, but maybe in subsequent years. The other issue is the uh, MRF, MRF merger. Uh, we are working through some of the no language yet, but uh, we're looking th working through the numbers with PERA and we'll come back with a recommendation hopefully in a couple weeks. Now I'll turn it over to Ms. Lesh, unless there's any questions, I'm sorry. Thank you. And Madam Chair and Council Members, um, I'm going to spend the majority of my time talking about um, the transportation bills uh, that are moving through the legislature at this time. So now we have uh, both a House and Senate proposal, and we have a proposal from the governor, although that has not been um, released in bill form yet. So we're going to wait to kind of dig into the details on that going forward, but I can provide at least an overview of that. Um, a significant difference, I would say, between the House bill versus the Senate and the governor's proposal. The Senate bill and the governor's proposal are, um, some of the numbers might be different, um, but a lot of the concepts are very similar. Um, the House has chosen to um, allot $750 million over the next four years, um, and uh, that is only to road and bridge funding. Of that $750 million, 200 of that is one-time money from this year's budget surplus. Uh, the rest of that revenue is uh, expected to be found in the um, highway, uh, the trunk highway fund and in one-time efficiencies in the Department of Transportation. There was an acknowledgement by the House um, when they presented uh, their proposal that this was a, not a long-term solution, um, that they were hoping to have future conversations about a more long-term permanent solution to the funding crisis that we have in transit and transportation, but this was at least the beginning of that conversation from their perspective. Um, I'm gonna walk through a bit of the details uh, specifically with the Senate bill because that is the one that we have uh, a lot of language on, and then I'll give a little bit of an overview um, with the governor's proposal as well. We'll have more detail when that bill comes out. Uh, the Senate bill would spend $850 million in 2016 and up to 1.7 billion annually beginning in 2017. Both the governor's bill and the Senate bill would include a new 6.5% wholesale gas tax uh, that would raise about 800, excuse me, $580 million a year. Over 10 years, that's about 4.4 billion. Uh, the Senate bill also inc includes an increased vehicle registration fee uh, that is not included in the governor's bill. A big difference, uh, especially for our residents they would be interested in and for the council between the governor's bill and the Senate bill is the difference in the metro area tax for transit, metro area sales tax that's designated for transit. The governor's proposing an additional half cent increase to bring the total tax to uh, three quarters of a cent. The Senate bill is recommending a three quarter cent increase to bring the metro tax to a full cent. Um, and what that would mean is about a $30 million difference per year. Uh, so the one cent, um, the at uh, one full cent, it would be about uh, 280 million a year, and the three quarter cent would be about 250 million dollars a year designated to transit in the metropolitan area. Uh, and for our residents, that at the full cent, that's about a dollar thirty a week. 
Uh, the Senate bill also proposes $1.5 billion in bonding for roads and bridges. Important for the City of Minneapolis included in that is $100 million designated for what we're calling mega bridges. Uh, bridges like 10th Avenue in Minneapolis, uh, the Kellogg Bridge in St. Paul, that we know are now in need of serious uh, rehabilitation and possible replacement. And there's a recognition on the part of the Senate that some of these bridges are really beyond the scope of, uh, of really any municipality's ability to pay. And so uh, the thought of to create a new subcategory for these mega bridges um, is present in the Senate bill. Another piece of the Senate bill that we're happy to see there included is uh, the concept of street improvement districts. This is a, a proposal that um, uh, came from the League of Minnesota Cities. They've been working on it for many years. We're happy to see that included there. This is a tool um, for local units of government uh, that don't already have a similar tool. Um, cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul um, being charter cities, we already have similar authority, uh, but for smaller cities, street improvement districts are a way to defer um, special assessments and property tax assessments um, to kind of defer those costs over a longer period of time so a homeowner isn't hit with a, a sizable bill when a particular project is done. Um, the bill, as it stands right now, would exempt certain uh, nonprofits, and we'll be working on language um, going forward with the League of Cities taking the lead on that piece. Um, the one piece also I'd like to mention in the governor's bill that we've heard some testimony on as well, uh, the governor is talking about with the, the additional sales tax revenue, uh, really having a lot of discussion about what that would actually look like on the ground in the metropolitan area going forward. Uh, we're talking about new bus routes, um, new transit shelters, increased service, both increased frequency and increased bus routes. And what that uh, sales tax would allow um, the Met Council to do is to actually accelerate some of the already existing plans for that bus route expansion that would have been a 30-year plan uh, to now be able to accomplish those expansions over a 10-year period. Um, when it comes to hearings, we've been having a lot of overview hearings about especially how transportation funding works in Minnesota and how transit and transportation funding works both in the metro and in greater Minnesota. As you all know, it's a pretty complex system. Um, and uh, we had just yesterday a, a second of a two-part hearing um, in the House uh, with the Met Council talking about their budget and their plans for the future, and also Greater Minnesota Transit uh, discussing how they run that program in Greater Minnesota and the state's piece in that program. Uh, we have also seen the creation of a new uh, committee, which is the, the Met Council um, Oversight and Accountability Committee. Uh, it's going to be chaired by Representative Linda Runbeck. Um, uh, they've only met, I think, twice now, so it will be interesting to see where the conversations go and where the uh, delineation is between the discussion of those issues in this committee versus the larger transportation committee. We'll see how they, they choose to handle that. There are no Minneapolis members, and I believe there are no St. Paul members on that committee as well. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, I think I would stand for questions on transportation. Questions or comments from committee members? I haven't seen any. Oh, thank you. Mr. Ramirez, I want to remind you, there is no companion to that committee in the Senate. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> thank you. Madam Chair, uh, we can stand for any questions or about other issues. Uh, they're the major ones we're following right now uh, in terms of what the legislature is up to. All right. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Ranieri. And I just want to note, I know that several committee members have been involved in, uh, I should say, council members in general, not just members on this committee, been involved in uh, watching and helping on various issues that were mentioned today or on other issues, including um, the driver's license bill. Um, that's when there's still some organizing going on around this um, uh, for non, uh, uh, non-residents. Um, uh, we also have had a lot of activity around transportation and how we can support um, the governor and the Senate's proposal and also augment some of those proposals in ways that um, uh, may enhance the success um, of uh, potential transportation bill. Um, and just want to especially call out Peter Reginius in the mayor's office and Councilmember Reich, our chair of our Transportation and Public Works Committee for their, I think, really hard-involved work uh, on that. 
So with that, I'm not seeing any questions from uh, Chair. Yep. I'd like to add a couple things. Uh, okay. The governor has proposed a bond, he may propose a bonding bill. It's maybe possibly as high as $800 million. We're not sure if it will be introduced, what will happen to that bill. There's a lot of concern that maybe we can't have a 2016 session. However, many leaders, particularly in the Senate, are suggesting that the bonding bill really is a long process. We started in April, May of the year prior. We are our tours throughout the summer and fall and winter, and a bonding bill is marked up and passed at the end of that process, usually during the even year session. It's possible that there may be a shorter session next year, and I think the bonding bill, and my colleagues can correct me, they have disagree with if they, if they do believe that there will be a bonding bill next year. About this year, I am not sure. So, uh, but we're going to watch it because there may be a proposal from the governor. Again, it would need 60% of the House and Senate to pass it. Another one is a proposal from the Department of Administration, and this deals with equity. The department is concerned that their uh, issue dealing with trying to get minority woman-owned businesses certified is a real cumbersome process. It, uh, it piggybacks with the federal process. It takes very long. So they are putting together a proposal. There's no language yet. And having a meeting tomorrow and uh, with... I think some folks from our city have been invited to, to discuss this whole issue of the cert, how can we speed up or streamline the certification process for minority woman-owned businesses and veteran businesses so they could apply for municipal, county, and state contracts. And that will be something we'll be seeing and we'll be watching as part of our equity agenda. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as this was just a verbal report, I don't think we need any action on this. Um, next is uh, an item from Community Planning and Economic Development on the Amil Lofts Hydroelectric Project. And so I invite forward staff who are going to present on this. The action that is proposed is to receive and file a draft letter in response to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's request for comments on the draft license application and draft preliminary draft environmental assessment on a lot of drafts uh, on the Amil Artist Lofts Hydroelectric Project and also to direct staff to continue working with the um, FERC on the review and approval process to ensure the city interests are addressed. All hey, right. thank you and good afternoon. I'm here from um, Long Range Planning in CPED on Highland Maze to talk about this proposal, which you've just summarized. Um, the Minnesota Leased Housing Associates for Limited Partnership, um, which is the DBA of the Dominium Housing Development is proposing this FERC application um, license to construct and operate the hydroelectric power plant project in the old Amil tunnel system. This map up here, I can't look and point at the same time. If you look at the red piece there, you can see where it is. It is directly across the river from us. It is, that tunnel system is more or less invisible from the surface because this, the inlet has been blocked by concrete since the 50s and is underground. Um, but is indeed, that is why it was in place, was for hydroelectric power. So it's an unusual opportunity to reuse that. Um, unusual is right about this project. Um, Dominium is a housing developer. They have not done one of these before. However, we have seen other of these before because Excel Energy um, is located almost immediately next door and is also licensed through FERC. Um, the process you're seeing in front of you is the standard federal process, which again is why it is at IGR um, rather than another committee. Um, they have submitted an application package uh, earlier in January and have given us 30 days as a city to review it. We are a responsive local government. But we don't have specific authority in this. It's just advisory. We don't get to vote pro or con. We just get to register our comments. Um, I'm going to summarize briefly what our comments are and then leave time for a question. Um, first of all, this is a project with a lot to like about it. Um, this is, of course, paired very closely with the housing project, which is currently under construction, the Amil Artist Loft project um, that is right now underway. And indeed, the time frame for this, which is somewhat compressed um, due to the review process, is responsive to that to ensure that the funding to allow for the construction of the hydroelectric is sort of bundled with the funding for the housing project. If you look at the deadlines for this, you'll see that they're right on top of one another, but that is really to be responsive and to make sure it keeps moving to actually allow them to complete that, this project still this year in 2015. Um, the housing project uh, is also underway during the same time period. We get to check, check a lot of boxes with this one. This is historic preservation in a rather big way. It increases density. It supports affordable housing. It allows support of the arts. It does green energy and it has a potential recreation and interpretive component that will add potentially a really great new destination to our central, central riverfront area. 
Um, the comments we have are numerous if you look in here, and that's not because we have a lot of problems with it. It's really because since there's been so much city investment in this area um, over a number of years, we know a lot about the details and we want to make sure to get them right. Um, just outlining major, major, major categories of comments and so their implications. Um, one is the question about water flow through here. This is an area that's, as I said, currently blocked off. Um, water will again through, flow through here. They have the rights to do that because it dates all the way back to when the Pillsburys were using the water to mill flour. Um, but it does mean that we are thinking about the issues of the water over the falls. Excel Energy is going into a process right now to sort of manage to say how much water can keep over the falls and still have it look good. The aesthetic flow survey is still underway. They have agreed to abide by the terms around that, which are a little complicated, but effectively mean that we will never be prioritizing hydroelectric power over the falls being an attractive asset in our central riverfront. So we um, have asked them to continue to support that and to continue to go along with that to make sure that that's taken into consideration. And indeed, they are parallel hookup to the grid so that if they can't produce enough power, this will produce no more actually than uh, maybe half to two thirds of their power in any case, um, they will be able to use the elect regular electricity grid to satisfy the rest of the need. It won't go dark. Um, that's one category. Another is, of course, the heritage preservation resources. These are unique and interesting. Um, the tunnel structure itself is um, 130 years old. Um, there's a lot of complicated questions around that. Um, they have done some work to date, it, part of it in partnership with city studies. And really, the commitment is that they have an ongoing understanding of the maintenance and ownership responsibilities and know that what, what needs to be done to make sure this stays in good shape for another 130 years hopefully. Um, so that's definitely part of our comments is making sure that the resource is respected and treated well. Another one is a little more of the expansionary view of this and it goes starts going beyond the scope of this but we think it's important as part of this conversation. Um, these tunnels are as I said kind of invisible. You don't access them unless well some people may have access to them, but probably not legally at this point, except for the, our investigators. Um, there is the potential that this could be um, made into a, some interpretive piece. Where people would be able to, with guides and with training and with all the right equipment, um, explore a little bit of our underground scene, which would be, of course, a great dimension to add to the other assets we have in terms of the trails and the parks, the Mill City Museum. Um, AMIL folks, Dominium have already committed to a space for a visitor center in their basement that would have access to the tunnels. There's still resources that are needed, still funding and more studies that are needed to make that happen. But we are calling it out, say, even though this hydroelectric facility is first and foremost a power generating facility to provide green energy for this place, there could be another dimension to this that would be a really great asset for the community. And we hope they would continue to work in partnership with us. Those are the major categories of comments. Again, there's some details. We can certainly get into any details you're interested in. Um, the time frame is relatively short as we're, we're here because they gave us 30 days and so that means as of February 20th, we're turning in comments. You're seeing a draft letter here. We say draft because, not because um, we anticipate a lot of major changes, but we wanted to give everyone the leeway to make adjustments as needed. And so we're not asking you to approve the letter, but to rather approve the submittal of the letter and to allow us to make changes or any changes that are suggested before then. So that is where the process is. After that, um, they have some additional steps at the federal level. Um, but as I said, they hope to have all the, whole, the hurdles cleared soon and be able to un be under construction later this year. Um, are there any, at this point, any questions or comments? All right, committee members, Council Member Fry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Mays, were you, were you finished? Or uh, I, I can certainly ask now unless you have more information to provide. Um, that was it. You're done, right. okay. Uh, first off, Ms. Mace, thank you very much for all your work on this. Obviously, it's a very complex project. Uh, first, I'd like to comment on the AML itself for uh, partly uh, for knowledge of my colleagues. Um, this is a uh, this is a project that is obviously the Pillsbury Animals is very historical. It's on St. Anthony, Maine there on the east side. It's affordable housing. It is uh, subsidized housing specifically for artists. It's incorporating the water to provide electricity, uh, not just for the AML, but, but also the adjacent two, or I believe three buildings. Is that right, Ms. Mays? It's yeah, the, the whole adjacent campus that's part of the development project. And, and the, so. the, we anticipate that that entire structure will ultimately, or those structures combined, will be um, powered by water, totally clean energy. Yes. They might not be able to get 100%, but they'll get as much as they can. They'll get as cl close as they yeah. can. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm very supportive of this project. I really appreciate all the work that has gone in thus far. I have gone in the uh, the tunnels legally, I believe. Um, 
Uh, and it's straight out of the movie Goonies. I mean, it's unbelievable. You can fit two tractor trailers side by side below San Anthony, Maine, and it goes out to the, um, the, the, the tunnel that ultimately hits the Mississippi River. Um, one, one point that I wanted to make is it's my understanding that they anticipate that the amount of water that will ultimately be siphoned off from the Mississippi is, is 200 CFS, cubic feet, cubic feet per second, yes. um, which is fairly minimal relative to some of the other proposals that are coming forward that also want to use the waterway. I, I want to make very clear that I am supportive of what the AML wants to do, one, because of the minimal, amount, minim, the minimal amount of water that they want to use, and two, because of the legal rights that they bought, I believe it was from like Princeton or Harvard or something. Mm -hmm. um, and the rights to the water, of course, came with the building itself from 100 plus years ago. Uh, but I do want to distinguish between the 200 CFS used by Pillsbury Amill and the 2000 plus CFS that is proposed to be used by a number of different companies, either Crown Hydro or um, Symphony. Yes. Um, and, uh, and as Councilmember Quincy pointed out, uh, Pillsbury Amill has agreed, and Dominium specifically, has agreed to comply with, along with Excel, uh, to, to be below the below the or above to keep the falls above the minimum amount that would ex still establish the the scenic element um so i i think all of the comments that we've got going forward allows for you know those two things to take place simultaneously but thank you other comments thank you for that councilmember cry um other comments from colleagues I'm not seeing any, so I will go ahead and uh, move the action that's before us, which again is to receive and file the draft uh, letter in response to, do you say FERC? Is that, she's not paying attention. Yes, okay, that's how you do the acronym there. And then also to direct staff to continue working with FERC on the review and approval process. So I'll move uh, uh, items A and B, all in approval, please say aye. I opposed, and that item is approved. Um, was there another, uh, Mr. Conover? Yeah, I am that. sorry, I should have paid more attention to the whispering and <laughs> noted that uh, there might have been an addition. So if we need to go back, uh, let me know. Okay, uh, if you look at the agenda, it has one recommendation, and then the recommendation has been amended in the uh, RCA and updated, and that's the one I'm really recommending. Is uh, one Can you read it to me, please? Yeah, uh, authorize the Community Planning and Economic Development Department's Executive Director or the Director's Designee to submit comments on behalf of the City on the draft license application and draft preliminary draft environmental assessment on the Pillsbury A. Mill Artist Lofts hydroelectric project that are generally consistent with the draft comments filed with the City Council. So, and that would be for A, I'm assuming? That, yeah, that would be for two, and and one is two. to receive and file the draft comments. So, excuse me, was that, so right now I read um, item 3A and 3B. Does the RCA differentiate? I'm just not looking the at RCA the RCA. is the same for 3A, but has what I read for 3B. Okay, so this is an amendment to, or a change from 3B. So, um, do I need to move to reconsider 3B then, and then... Okay, so I guess I will then move to update the staff direction to reflect uh, the language used in the actual request for council action as uh, read to us by Mr. Conover. Uh, on approval, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? And that item is approved. So thank you very much. Um, next, we have an item on housing warranties. This is a proposed amendment to our state legislative agenda. Mr. Ranieri. Madam and Chair, this is this is a, I just want to introduce that this is an item that Councilmember Fry has particularly worked on. So, Madam Chair, that is correct. Uh, Councilmember Fry brought this issue to us. As you're aware, we've had a, a building boom in our city, particularly in multifamily housing. I think the numbers state over the last two years or so, about 4,500 units have been at least uh, uh, building permits for, and we see cranes all over the city, uh, particularly residential family, multifamily housing. But when you look a little deeper, you discover most of those units, almost entirely all of those units, are rental housing. 
and at least in many of our communities, people are asking, I'd like to stay in the city, I'd like to go into something smaller, I would like a condo. And the concern is that no condos are being built. Uh, Councilmember Fry and others have been doing some research, and we've done some research with him, and discovered there may be some problems with the warranty laws of our state. There appears a conflict between the common interest community uh, statute and the housing warranty statute. And as part of the discussion, we've been meeting with the Builders Association and legislators and are suggesting that we need to come up with a process that is similar for people to have their, have their warranty grievances uh, settled. So we are uh, not yet with language, but we are suggesting that we be permitted support action to do this so that we can hopefully get this resolved, hopefully to the satisfaction of all the stakeholders, and it includes the trial lawyers, the builders, the developers, and it's not only a Minneapolis issue, it's a statewide issue. So we have some interest from legislators from around the region and around the state, and hopefully we'll have something drafted soon for the council to look at. Uh, council Member Fry has been at a lot of the meetings and have been in, has, been suggestion, has been in several discussions suggesting language, and I would yield to him, Madam Chair, if it's okay. All right, thank you very much, Council Member Fry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rainier, for all your work getting this set up. Uh, just to give my colleagues a little bit of background on, uh, uh, Mr. Rainier pointed out that they, yes, there is a housing boom that is predominantly um, rental right now. In fact, there's really only one or two developers that are doing any owner-occupied whatsoever. And the big reason is there's a 10-year statute of limitations on owner-occupied. So you can sue up to 10 years if there is a quote-unquote major structural deficiency associated with the project. So inevitably what happens is after nine and a half years, the attorneys come in, they have the inspector to look through the whole place, and they find something. Um, the developer gets sued, they lose millions of dollars, and they say, I'm never, ever, ever Ever going to do another owner-occupied project again, which is the present state now. Now, there's a two-year statute of limitations on rental. Two-year statute of limitations on rental, um, which is obviously a lot easier. So by the time any structural deficiencies were, uh, were could you know, come to bear, the, two years, the statute is already gone. So this actually helps both ends. On the one hand, it'll help developers to uh, in a, in, a, in a safe, uh, conservative manner, build owner-occupied. On the other hand, what it's going to prevent is, is a loophole that's formed, and actually I've been using. Um, so if once the two-year statute, if you tell the, the developer to build um, transitional housing, which means it can accommodate both rental as well as owner-occupied, uh, the two-year statute of limitations, and, and they build it as rental initially, let me take a step back. I'm not explaining this very well. Uh, Two-year statute of limitations on rental. If you tell them to build rental uh, that can be transitioned to owner-occupied, then the two-year statute lapses. Then they change it over to owner-occupied. Um, their, their, any deficiency thereafter is not covered. So on the one hand, we're protecting consumers because we're getting rid of this loophole so they can continue to sue if there is, in fact, a real structural deficiency. And on the other hand, we're finding uh, a, a better way for them to build owner-occupied without um, undue risk. Uh, so this really helps both sides. I'm confident, I ho hope, that this uh, can be a bipartisan effort over at the legislature. It should be. Um, it's common sense. And uh, I look forward to working to get this thing passed. Thank you. Um, I can't remember, Mr. Ranieri, if in your introduction you identified who is going to be the lead on this. I know that you've been working with, uh, I think, some organizations that would be more appropriately a lead, and then we would support uh, a bill that was proposed if that does happen. Madam Chair, we're working with two organizations at this point. One is the Minnesota Builders Association, and the other is the Builders Association of the Twin Cities. Okay. And also some of the lead legislators have not only been meeting with those groups and ourselves, but also with the trial lawyers. And I think at the time, the realtors will be coming also involved in this process. Okay. Thank you. I think that just helps uh, for us to understand. Uh, we traditionally wouldn't be a lead on something like this, but we certainly um, have ideas, as happened with Councilmember Fry, that come forward and uh, we want to find, is there a solution? And um, it's good that we have identified um, some partners on this. I'm going to go ahead and move this, and then uh, we'll see if there's any further discussion. Um, I'm suspecting that. 
uh, but I'll move approval of an amendment to um, our state legislative agenda. It's in the section on policies to enhance community stabilization and strength uh, with language that would say support legislation that amends statutes relating to housing warranties in common interest communities so that individual property owners in common interest communities have a similar process to remedy warranty issues. And discussion on that? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And that item is approved. Next, we have another proposed amendment. I'm not sure who's on this. Uh, Ms. Bergman, if you want to come forward. On uh, our uh, state legislative agenda, and this relates to language that currently is in the agenda on paid uh, sick leave, and we have some updates that are being recommended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Again, Sasha Bergman from the IGR Department. Um, the RCA before you does recommend an amendment to the City of Minneapolis's 2015 policy positions on page 12, although if you'd like to put it, uh, make it as an amendment to the legislative agenda document, certainly um, that, would be, that would be just fine as well. Um, right now the recommendation is to page 12 under the building wealth um, heading of the eliminating racial and gender disparity section would be to add um, state legislation that would expand earned sick and safe time benefits uh, to all of the items that are on that list. Um, and really, uh, this, this is a conversation that has been taking place over a number of years. Many bills in the past have um, authorized uh, or have uh, sought to authorize paid sick time. And this week, there were two bills that were introduced, one by Representative Lesh and one by Senator Pappas, uh, to provide earned sick and safe leave to Minnesotans um, kind of in recognition of the fact that in Minnesota, 41% of workers don't have access to paid sick leave according to the Institute for Women's Policy Research. Um, the access, the le level of access is even lower among some communities of color. And a report called The Status of Women and Girls in Minnesota states that 80% 80, 80 of Minnesota's low wage workers don't have access to paid sick days. Uh, past efforts have been really about sick leave, which is how the, the policy position amendment is drafted currently on the RCA. But the conversation has kind of changed to really recognize that some working Minnesotans also have needs that go beyond sick time to include safe time to take care of themselves and their families in times of emergency, maybe due to um, domestic abuse or physical injury or mental injury uh, there. So if the committee is... Um, interested, we may recommend instead of the, the amendment that's there to instead say state legislation that would expand, uh, expand access to earned sick and safe time benefits. And with that, I'm happy to stand for questions. Okay, hang on just a minute, Ms. Bergman. Um, I think, and, and I'll just note, I had referenced a proposed resolution um, that had been forwarded, and I think when we were reviewing it up here, there had been a little bit of question about the statement on uh, domestic violence that mm -hmm. was in there, whether that was intended to be in there or not, and I take it from your introductory comments that you actually did intend that statement to be yeah. in the proposed resolution. I think when we were, uh, Councilmember Kauna was the one who had noted it, and we weren't sure if that was intended to be there or not. Just um, I, Councilmember Glenn, I will also note that that's, that um, statistic in the res drafted resolution is a national statistic. It's not Minnesota. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, so that statement would stay in there. And I apologize. We're just working on the fly here a little bit. So whereas domestic violence results in more than 1,000 deaths and 2 million injuries among women. And, okay, I, I think what was a little confusing is, and, and I realized I had asked Ms. Bergman to work on a resolution on very short notice, so I just want to say. <laughs> um, and, and so we may want to maybe take a look at this and bring something at the full council meeting. I think what maybe is just missing a little bit is what's the connection to the time off that's needed, mm -hmm. and that's why it seemed just a little bit confusing when we looked at it. It makes total sense when you are introducing this right here, and maybe uh, we can just work on tweaking that language so that we have something that 
that makes sense. And again, this is my fault, um, not anybody else's, because I quickly asked Ms. Bergman to put something together, knowing that there's a lot of attention on this issue. I think we have policymakers in Minneapolis and frankly across the state who are really, across the nation, who are really seeing this as one of a multitude of issues that need to be addressed so that we are really all benefiting from economic recovery and we're just um, seeing so many uh, reports from academics as well as personal stories that we hear from people we know, from constituents in our wards about how we are not all experiencing economic recovery. We, um, I think we just uh, saw a report even today, uh, uh, again, talking about Minnesota in particular, having uh, just a tremendous gap in terms of who is experiencing economic recovery and, and how that makes it very difficult to, to just live and, and pay rent um, or, or pay your mortgage or whatever that may be, and uh, your ability to um, take time off when you are sick is something that both impacts you and everyone around you, your coworkers as well as your family. So, um, uh, so I want to thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, Councilmember Quincy. Thank you, Madam Chair, <clears throat> and thanks for bringing this forward. It's a very important topic and obviously something we're very supportive of. My question is, about having access to paid sick leave. Um, what's the difference between having access and requiring that to be an option? Or how, what's the, the state's role in providing access? Uh, Madam Chair and Councilmember Quincy, I think that is really just to say that the state would be taking act action to ensure that all Minnesotans have access to it or have it. So if you, you know, if you would prefer to not have that language, I think no, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. I just wanted to make sure it was clear. Is, is the state going to be mandating this as a as coverage? Uh, That's the proposed bill. Yes, Mr. Chair and members, um, I could get I can get more information to you on the exact bill language and kind of what would be required. I think it depends um, based on size of employers and and oh. things like that. I'm okay. happy to provide you with no. some more information on that. Look forward to that. Uh, kind of follow up, I had those kind of questions. Okay. And uh, obviously, you know, several cities have taken that action. Does the state of Minnesota provide um, sick leave in, in this family family? There is a as not state employees? The, oh, to the, to the state employees? Well, I think those are good questions that there's some fact sheets and I think we might uh, forward some of that information around. Um, I, I'll just say again, I think um, government entities uh, probably fall on the positive end of employers who um, provide appropriate benefits to ensure that when you're sick, you are going to be able to take time off without yeah. having to worry that that's an unpaid day. Um, you know, we can just even examine our own benefits uh, structure, which I think Ms. Bergman has uh, made an inquiry to our own HR department about how our city workers are covered. Um, and so I, I just wanna say, I think government actually uh, has done a good job um, overall without getting into the details of setting that <clears throat> expectation. Um, and we're looking here with this action about how the state can ask all employers or those that fit a certain criteria mm -hmm. to um, adopt such a uh, requirement as uh, part of uh, um, safety, essentially, and security for um, employees. Yes, uh, Madam Chair and Councilmember Quincy, I might just add that I found in my uh, quick research on this, I believe it was the Bureau of Labor Statistics has sort of a, a, a maybe a one page or something, or a few pages on the um, paid sick leave uh, across the country in state and local governments. And the percentages are, are much higher for you know local government employees than they are for employees in the private sector. I wanna say um, it was in the 80% range for local governments um, in terms of the amount of employees that have access to paid sick leave and then around 60% for private uh, sector. And of course, therein it, it depends on the whether it's a service industry job or other pro professional uh, jobs, of course, the, the range is different for private sector there. But I'm happy to provide you with that information as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Obviously, uh, collecting all this is just going to spur more questions. So we <laughs> appreciate looking uh, at that information as it comes forward. But I'm very supportive of this action and adding it to our agenda. So thank you, Madam Chair, for bringing that forward. 
All right. Well, I will go ahead then and move, and we will actually be moving the alternative suggested language, which is to amend our um, policy positions um, by adding the following language, and that would be state legislation that would expand access to earned sick and safe time benefits. And I believe with that, uh, I have um, we have that action in front of us. On approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed, and that item is approved. Thank you very much, Ms. Bergman. And finally, we have an action uh, that is a request to authorize the City of Minneapolis to become a formal member of the Minnesota Homes for All Coalition. Ms. Bergman. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Yes, before you is a, a request for um, committee action to approve our formal uh, membership of the Minnesota Homes for All Coalition. Um, just as background, uh, the IGR staff here in, in the city have been involved in the, the Homes for All Coalition's policy development process for at least the last two legislative sessions, but have never been official members of the coalition. Um, I believe you should have in front of you a list of the Homes for All endorsing organizations, which is what we would be um, adding ourselves to if this action uh, moves forward today. There's more than 100 organizations of housing advocates and other stakeholders, um, including um, other cities, or at least the city of St. Paul for sure, and I know, I don't believe that our, our membership organizations of Metro Cities and the League of Minnesota Cities are formal members, but I know that they are in the loop on the policy development in the Homes for All Coalition. Um, the coalition of stakeholders came together in 2012 to better coordinate in hopes of having a similar message and sort of pull together all of their allies and resources on um, some agreed upon priorities in the area of affordable housing and housing um, priorities. And last year in the bonding bill, $100 million in affordable housing um, dollars were allocated, um, which is I, th I think one of the most significant investments in affordable housing um, in in history or in recent history at least at the legislature. Um, I believe 20 million of that was set aside for public housing authorities and I, I don't I don't know the list of public housing authorities that have applied for that money, but I'm, I'm in the process of getting that for you as well. Um, this year, uh, the Homes for All Legislative Coalition's ask of the legislature is $39 million uh, for various um, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency and Department, uh, Minnesota Department of Human Services programming, including uh, Family Homeless Prevention Assistance Program for direct assistance um, to the homeless and those at risk of uh, losing their housing and transitioning out of homelessness, and then also the Homeless Youth Act, which are both efforts that are, uh, the city supports in either the policy positions or in the existing legislative agenda. I can't recall which one. So um, just, um, you know, thought maybe it would be good to, to formally join the coalition. Um, it's some, a group of folks that we've been working with over the past couple of years, and they've been doing successful work up at the Capitol. So happy to stand for questions. Questions, Council, Mem Council President Johnson. Um, just a question, uh, Madam Chair, and it, and it reminds me of the budget discussion that we had where we had a group of people coming and telling us that they wanted us, wanted us to spend, and I'm trying to remember how many, was it $20 million of city funds um, for for housing or, or what would you call it? Um, Trust fund. Trust fund. Uh, yeah, but it, but I mean, it was it was a coalition of people who were in. I mean, obviously, housing advocates that wanted the city individually to um, prioritize twenty million dollars in our budget this last fall for uh, affordable housing. And so, I'm just curious. I'm. I hope we're not signing on to that. I guess is my is my thought. So, um, Madam Chair and Council President, I am not aware that that's the same group. I know um, I'm looking at my colleague, Melissa Lesh, who's also Why don't you involved. come on up and let us know yeah. what's the, I just want to make sure if there was a question here that we have the opportunity yeah. to kind yes. of clarify. Thank you, uh, Ms. Berkman. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council President. Um, I can't reference who the group was that was specifically requesting the, the city allocation of housing trust from the 20 million, but I can say that the Homes for All Coalition is really a, a statewide association, right. okay. and mm -hmm. most of their work is targeted at, at legislation and statewide pieces at the Capitol, okay. so it would not have been the same Great. group. Thank you I, very much. I, I want to say, too, as just another caveat, is that the, the Homes for All Coalition includes several quasi-public uh, bodies or public bodies, 
uh, whereas the group that was organizing around uh, recommending to the city in particular of a certain amount for our housing uh, trust fund was uh, primarily nonprofit organizations and individuals um, who organize around housing issues. So I, I do think although there is some overlap in those organizations, it's, it's really a very different, different group. I apologize. Councilmember Quincy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is a little bit about the word membership. Is there a cost to this membership? Is there a financial impact to this? Uh, Madam Chair and Councilmember Quincy, good question. Um, I think, I, you know, I believe the word membership is just sort of used loosely here, and really it's just adding our list to the endorsing organizations of the Homes for All Coalition. All right. Well, I'm, I'm very supportive of uh, joining the uh, Home uh, Homes for All Coalition. I wondered if we could um, amend our uh, RCA or uh, action that we'd be taking to uh, remove the word member and uh, endorsing organization or join or whatever you'd like to do. But I don't want to be this confused with some of the other strategic partnerships that are in the city that have a financial impact that requires a different uh, level of action. So thank you. Thank you, and, 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 and I appreciate actually, Councilmember Quincy, your attention to the wording because I was actually confused about that in the presentation because it doesn't sound actually like it's a membership per se. It does sound like it is an endorsement of the coalition. I didn't hear that we we're part of a group that, um, it sounds like they have a pretty broad coalition of how they develop their final agenda. And I don't know if you wanna say anything more about how they develop the agenda, and is there a difference between saying we're a member versus an endorsing organization? It may be more appropriate for this action to say that we would support being an endorsing organization. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I agree with um, Councilmember Quincy's uh, amendment to the, the recommendation to authorize the city to become a formal endorsing organization of the Homes for All Coalition. I think that's a very good distinction and um, I, I wish I would have thought of that before writing the RCA, so I apologize for that. But I think that's a good distinction to make. Um, the, the Homes for All Coalition is a sort of a, or the, they have a, a broader um, set of organizations that come together, kind of the, a board, I guess, or of, of sorts, I would say, but they also have three different um, teams, at which of, of which uh, we are a part of the policy team, but there's also a communications team and the community engagement team. And on the policy team, it's convened by the Metropolitan Consortium of, of Community Developers and the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. Um, but they are just really kind of for organizational purposes, they organize the meetings and the agenda for what's discussed at the meetings to develop the policies that they plan to bring forward to the board for adoption before a legislative agenda. Hopefully that helps, but I'm happy to answer further questions. All right, I'm not seeing any other follow-up questions, so I think I will make the motion and uh, just uh, tweak it to uh, be a motion to authorize the City of Minneapolis to become an endorsing organization of the Minnesota Homes for All Coalition. All in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And that item is approved. I believe with that we have concluded with our agenda for today. So we are adjourned. Thank you very much.